Hey, Steve Mignani here with some really good junkyard news. If you're gonna be anywhere near Sherman, Texas on March 24th and 25th, know that there's gonna be an outdoor auction uh, put on by Duncan'sAuctions.com of over 200 solid Texas parts vehicles. It's gonna be Fords, GM, Mopar, lots of tractors and even forklifts. These things all have to go. It's an online auction, but also an on-site auction. If you happen to be in Sherman, Texas, you can go and bid in person or again online but all 200 vehicles have to go don't let them get crushed to learn more about this auction which happens on march 24th and 25th of 2023 uh, check it out on duncansauctions.com and keep in mind if you're seeing this after march 24th or 25th 2003 the auction's over with but before then make sure you check it out and save some of these cars don't let them go to the crusher Hey, Steve Mignani here doing the junkyard crawl at Bernardstown Auto Wrecking in Bernardstown, Massachusetts with a 1971 old Cutlass S. Now, uh, a few weeks ago, we did a 68 Cutlass S, the first year for the Cutlass S. Of course, S, a little extra luxury, not muscle, but luxury. And of course, 1971, the next to last year for this styling cycle, which went 68 through 72. Now, in 1971, these mid-sized A-body F85 and Cutlass accounted for 41% of all Oldsmobile sales. In other words, you know, about 60% were the full-size cars, you know, Deltas, et cetera, et cetera, Tornados, that sort of thing. But 41% were still these mid-sized cars right here. And of the 234,020 F85s and Cutlasses built, a total of 63,314 were two-door Cutlass S hardtops like this one. Now the front has been removed from this one. We can still learn a few things. Uh, kind of cool to see right here. Here's the, the hood release T right here. You would pull that, the hood would come halfway up and you'd gain access to the engine. Now 1971 was the year that all of General Motors went to the ability to run on unleaded gasoline. Compression fell to eight and a half to one on every engine GM made because in 1970, the Clean Air Act mandated that by 1996, all gasoline would have no lead. Now, what is lead? Well, in 1922, Charles Kettering, working at the Delco Labs, came up with tetraethyl lead, T-E-L, as an anti-knock component that allowed engines to not have pre-ignition. But the only problem is by 1965, blood tests showed that Americans, on average, had 100 times the amount of lead in their bloodstream as did people from other countries. So lead was a problem. One plus one equals duh. Lead ain't good. So again, the Clean Air Act of 1970 began the decline of lead, which by 1996, no lead at all. But again, 71, Oldsmobile, GM, all of GM, in fact, said, okay, we all have to run on unleaded fuel, which meant low compression to get uh, away from knock, you know? Now this one here, this is a, a 350 almost certainly, uh, this has a four barrel carburetor. Uh, the only thing I'm a little worried about, this here is an EGR valve. These came along, I think in 76. It's possible this is a later 350, maybe a 455. And frankly, this thing is so buried in pine leaves, I'm not digging in. But here are the valve covers here, the Oldsmobile rocket valve covers with the little chimneys on top. The, world, the word Oldsmobile kind of stamped right in there. Um, baffles here to keep the oil vapors from getting to the uh, the PCV equipment. <clears throat> and again, you can always tell an Olds V8 or at least a 64 up, the 330 through 455 by this puppy right here. This is the oil filler and uh, that's where you add your oil, not through the dipstick. So like when you see a Trans Am 1978, 7980, uh, or 7980, no, no 80s, but this right here is the oil fill. You see the shaker on a Trans Am when you see that, ah, that's the 403 Oldsmobile, not the Pontiac 400, next. Anyway, uh, this car here, it's sort of an interesting little classroom, if you will. Uh, I love the muscle car tire, the Kelly Supercharger belted front tire on this thing. It's wide. And one thing I love about belted tires is the way of an abrupt 90 degree edge right there. Nice wide tread, but again, supercharger. Now this one has drum brakes, power drums, an iron drum right here. 70 bucks would get you the optional discs. And so in other words, in 1971 and 72, drum brakes were still standard on these things. 73, they, they went to disc brakes on all of them. But this, we've shown this before, but this shows that the nine and a half inch GM drum brake didn't have to be horrible. This is from a GTO. 
1965, 6, and I believe 67. Uh, and also Oldsmobile or Buick GS cars had these as well. Finned aluminum construction, very advanced stuff, dissipates heat, integrally cast uh, nine and a half by three inch or two and a half inch uh, friction liner right there. So this is, it would bolt right on. But again, these were never available uh, on these Oldsmobiles in 1971, but they go right on if you want. But uh, anyway, this one here is a two-door hard top. You can see right here. And before we get any further, let's show here. Car Life magazine, June 1970. And the big deal, the death of high compression right there on the cover of the Trans Am, the Z28, the uh, Javelin, the Boss 302 Mustang. And what's that all about, the death of high compression? Well, here it says, you are going to pay for cleaner air. Your first installment is due this fall. The muscle car is being taken out of the muscle car, or the muscle is being taken out of muscle cars. The high compression engine has just been sentenced to death. No more 11 to 1, 12 to 1 LED8s or Boss 302s or Z28. Starting with a 71 model year, high compression will refer to engines with compression ratios on the order of 8.221. General Motors has stated that all its 71 engines will operate satisfactorily on unleaded gasoline. And it says down here, Removing the lead will drop the octane number about eight points. Regular grades will fall to 86 or 87 octane, while premium would be in the 90 to 92 range. And at the bottom it says, high compression engines operated on regular gas subjected to detonation or ping. The engine runs, but that pinging is playing havoc with the engine's innards. The noise you hear is caused by extremely high pressure waves bouncing around inside the cylinders. This can severely damage pistons, rings, and valves. That's the exact same stuff than the early days of the automobile, 1920. Uh, Charles Kettering from the GM research, research Labs solved with tetraethyl lead. But again, getting into the bloodstream of human beings, not a good idea. So again, it was phased out after, you know, a 40-year run, 50-year run. But inside this, we see, of course, the, uh, the second to last year for the hardtop body. No more hardtops. 1973 would bring the colonnade body style. We see this right here. This is a Johan 1975 Olds Cutlass, basically the brother to the car we're looking at right here. But the thing we'll notice on the colonnade cars is that big B pillar that's baked right in. There's no hardtops on the colonnades at all. This one here is a 75 catalytic converter, beginning of the end. This is a promo from Johan. And again, the funny thing is these colonnade cars, the, the Malibu, uh, the, the Pontiac Grand Prix, Le Mans, all that stuff, you'd think that they would have been very popular with model builders. The only two that I know of are the Johan, uh, Olds Cutlass right here, and of course AMT also did a 73 Malibu, but only as a NASCAR. The Donnie Allison car here, big block engine under the hood, but again, AMT did not make a stock 73 Malibu. You gotta wonder why the Colnod cars were not popular with the car, the model manufacturers. Uh, usually, you know, the, the new cars were the first thing to be kitted and allowed to be sold it, uh, to the kids, but not so much with the Colnod. Kind of weird. Now, this one here, the rear axle is gone. This would have been a, uh, uh, a corporate 10 bolt or the C clip type uh, Buick Olds Pontiac. A uh, little Salisbury axle, not a big piece at all. The trunk lid's gone on this one, but again, as a Cutlass S. This is not a muscle car. We will not see the dual exhaust trumpets that you'd see on a 442. On the 442, there'd be a little cutout right here in uh, 71 and 72 that would alert you to the, the W motor potentially under the hood. This is basically a, a bread and butter cutlass. But again, these things were very, very popular. Over 63,000 of these things were sold in 71. Coming around here, Super Shane, if you would, put it in four low and crawl over the, the wreckage. Here's the S, indicative of the cutlass S, this puppy right here. And it's cool to see right here, all the stickers. This was probably owned by a hot rodder, Pennzoil, Perfect Circle, uh, Snap-on Tools, and this right here. If you lived in Belchertown, Mass, you knew Mike's Speed Equipment. Mike Flynn, he's passed away, rest in peace, but he used to have a thing called Midnight Productions. And right there on Route 9 in Belchertown, Mass, in front of the Mike Speed place, there was actually two spots right there on Route 9 with VHT and slick marks, Midnight Productions, with street races they used to put on right in front of Mike's Speed Shop. So that sticker right there, if you're from New England, you'll know what Mike's Speed Shop is, is all about. Kind of cool to see that. So this car probably was tuned up by Mike's or maybe somebody just wanted to be like Mike, as they say. But inside this one here, no four-speed, no three-speed manual. Like most Cutlass S's, there's that shifter automatic.
automatic on the column. This is probably a bench seat car. And notice how in the uh, instrument cluster here, we see on the far right hand side, if you were cheap enough not to buy the clock, you got that block off, that circle with just uh, indicators of north, south, east, west, and who knows whatever else. So it looks like a clock, but it ain't a clock. If you're too cheap not to buy the clock, GM punished you. But again, the interior, the wood grain, the buttons on the upholstery, that's, that's a cutlass S upscale luxury interior stuff. Now, something that's kind of weird about this, the windshield on this one is busted up and gone, but look at this. This is basically uh, signs. It's this glass right here is pretty nasty stuff. That'll slice you up. Some would say, how could they make a windshield out of that? Well, frankly, there's a plastic laminate between these two things so that if this should break when it's new and fresh, the plastic laminate keeps this thing from being a, a razor blade. But with time, it lam delaminates, and this is what you get, these nasty, almost like a house window, ready to slice you open. It's tinted. You know, it is definitely uh, the windshield of the car. But again, Mother Nature takes over delaminating even a safety glass windshield. Well, that's the story of the 1971 Cutlass S. Next to last year for this styling cycle, some say a beautiful, desirable car. I agree with them. And again, this one being a two-door hardtop, there was also posts, but not in the Cutlass S. Uh, it's kind of sad to see it here, but I think this one's uh, street racing days are, are over. Now, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe to the Steve Magnus YouTube channel, uh, share this video, give it a like, and be sure to hit the bell so that you know when the next video happens and that's tomorrow morning.